Council Member Albernaz actually uh, flagged this issue for us, um, and uh, we felt it would be a good time to um, have a briefing about this. Really appreciate um, Director uh, Rashidi for coming over to tell us a little bit about what's going on. I will like to turn it on to Council Member Albernaz to just kind of frame it, and then of course we'll hear the briefing and uh, ask questions. Council Member Albernaz. Thank you very much, Madam President. I want to express my appreciation to you and my colleagues for your flexibility in adding this to, I know, a very tight agenda. Um, in informal conversations with you guys and at the formal session that we had to discuss state legislation, uh, there were some questions regarding this wonderful pilot initiative that I had the opportunity to have a conversation with representatives uh, with DOT about, about a month ago in my office, and did feel that there were some questions and, and wanted to, to have a follow-up, and my colleagues expressed an interest in hearing that follow-up. And so that's the purpose of this meeting. Uh, I will say that I was not focused on this issue and appreciated the novelty and actually thought these e-scooters looked like a lot of fun to ride. Uh, it wasn't until about a month ago uh, that I was in the District of Columbia for a meeting uh, very close to the corner of 11th and Pennsylvania Avenue, and I was feeding money into my meter, and out of the corner of my eye, I could feel that something was awry, and there was a gentleman with ear pods holding a cup of coffee uh, that was accelerating at an extraordinarily high rate of speed around a corner, lost control of the vehicle, and I literally had to dive out of the way to not be hit. Now, the good news is I was a goalkeeper in soccer in college, uh, and I still got it, so, uh, so that felt good. Um, but, but it struck me that had I been a senior citizen or had I been my wife holding the hand of our two-year-old daughter, uh, there could have been a very serious injury. Uh, and so, um, and of course, as we learned recently through reports in the Washington Post, the CDC is enacting a comprehensive analysis because of just how quickly these have emerged in cities across the country. As of December, they are now in 85 jurisdictions. And there, unfortunately, have also been deaths and significant increases in injuries and rises to emergency rooms. So as chair of the Health and Human Services Committee, I also had an interest in the public health component of this conversation. And I have a great deal of faith in our Department of Transportation. I really appreciate all your efforts to look at the most flexible means by which we can move our residents around in a safe and an environmentally friendly way, and looking for creative solutions to address the many traffic issues. But of course, public safety and health and wellness is an important component to that. So. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to you, Mr. Rashti, to share with us your PowerPoint presentation, and then I'm sure my colleagues and I will have some follow-up questions after. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. I appreciate it. And I, before I start, I want to sh share with you that as a director of Montgomery County Department of Transportation, safety of our residents uh, is paramount. It's my job number one. And, uh, and, and I share your concern and your, uh, your thoughts. Uh, and uh, for that reason, I think uh, as we go through our presentation, you will see that we have gone through a very lengthy process in terms of assuring safety and also bringing this new, uh, new um, I would say, duckless vehicle to our county because we're seeing that uh, all over the country this is uh, expanding rapidly. Uh, the topic for this presentation, by the way, uh, ma many of your questions will be answered as we go through the presentation because uh, we will be talking. Could you change? Yeah, we will be talking about uh, personal uh, mobility choices and then uh, about our pilot phasing, uh, and uh, of course uh, we will ta talk about the safety uh, concerns and uh, uh, that we have that you have expressed, as well as uh, legislation that has just passed in at the state level. Uh, county regulation we will talk about, and uh, our MOU, and what we are asking our contractors or vendors to do. And uh, finally, we will talk about expansion of the system. Uh, let me start by uh, saying that personal mobility is, is in support of the county executive goals in, in terms of greener community, uh, easier commute, and safe neighborhood, and effective, sustainable government. Not only that, uh, these uh, ductless uh, uh, vehicles are in, uh, serve our department mission and vision. 
And, um, and uh, as we go through this, I'm not going to read these things because you have it in front of you, but uh, it also answers a broader needs as demonstrated by regional trend. We will talk about what's going on in other, some of the other jurisdictions, and you will see. Um, we have always talked about the first and last mile uh, to, to, for trans, to, for in, to help our uh, connecting our uh, users to transit and employment. And the duckless vehicle and duckless bikes have played a major role. It, it helps us to, do, to achieve that goal. It's a broader transit access for minorities and underserved communities. Uh, it, uh, we are seeing a, a tremendous interest in private uh, developers and property managers. It supports the county's uh, transportation demand management goals. Uh, it supports our climate goals because it's a zero emission vehicle. It reduces auto trips and parking demands. And uh, finally, uh, it is, it's interesting that some of the larger municipalities in Montgomery County opted to uh, join the ductless bike share, such as Gaithersburg, Rockville, and Tacoma Park. I now will turn it over to Chris to go over some of the data and the information that we have gathered to share with you. Good morning, everybody. Um, just to recap something Al said, these do look like fun, uh, but we're not doing this just for fun. We do think there are real transportation opportunities here. And as you all know, with every new opportunity, there are new risks. So we're trying to understand what those risks are and manage those risks through our approach to this program. But we, we did some research to understand what kind of benefits we might realize from this. So you'll see some survey results here from Baltimore City and uh, I think also Portland, Oregon. And one of the things we were trying to understand is why are people using these scooters? And you see in this first slide, the survey results show that about 28% are using them to get around more easily or faster. As we look at the next slide, the most common reasons why people are using these are to travel for entertainment, socializing, dining, those activities that are not work, but they're the, the, the play components of a lifestyle, which is good, that's about 35%. And another 25% are using them to commute. So these are real transportation activities that are replacing other trips on our networks. Uh, one interesting finding from the Portland survey on the next slide shows what kinds of trips these are replacing. Um, the question was, if this service hadn't been available, how would you have traveled otherwise? The first one, about 14% would have driven their own car or used a car share vehicle, and about 35% would have used uh, some other type of automobile-oriented mobility service, taxi, Uber, or Lyft. So this survey indicates, of course, we don't have data beyond the surveys yet, that these trips are replacing auto trips on the networks in these cities. How did we go about rolling this out? Well, you probably... Remember, even if you weren't paying attention to these details back last year, we had a dockless pilot program in Silver Spring. We had a somewhat rocky start to that with a flood of bikes into the business district that resolved itself in a matter of weeks. Uh, we, once that program stabilized, we did see, see good outcomes of it. About 18,000 bike trips were made in the six months of that pilot. Most of them were within the pilot. Um, very few issues of them blocking access to buildings, uh, bus stops, or other features of the sidewalk. Uh, and we saw an increase in total bike use, and we did not see a noticeable impact to the capital bike share system use. This, these were largely trips in addition to the use of capital bike share. Good support from the program, about 84% of the survey respondents said they wanted to see the program continue. But they did mention the need for more bike racks, which many have been installed in Silver Spring since this pilot, and expanded outreach and education, which is a component of our program moving forward. Just this past winter, we expanded that pilot with a vendor, um, Lime, who was offering e-bikes. We extended it to the North Bethesda area. We conducted three open houses and a series of community meetings associated with that to understand what community issues or concerns people might have. And we heard a number of them, and we've embedded them into the draft MOU that's in your packet. Um, and that pilot was expanded, and the e-bikes were added. But sadly, um, that pilot didn't last all that long, as these companies were not seeing the profitability with e-bikes as a standalone service that they wanted to. And we had our last e-bike trip in March in the pilot area, so we haven't seen any 
bikes in April um, from that provider. Uh, we are now looking at expanding this to the third phase of the pilot program, a uh, six-month extension, up to a year if it's going well. We have published a solicitation asking for letters of interest from companies that provide these services. We received a, a number of them. I think it was eight or maybe more eight. Um, in that solicitation, we said we would select four, and we had a preference for companies that would provide both bikes and scooters. Uh, around the same time we were developing this letter of interest, we reached out to every sub-jurisdiction within Montgomery County, so the cities, towns, and actually some other taxing districts and smaller entities, and asked whether they would want to opt in and, or out of this program if we offered it. Uh, and we got a response from just about everybody, and as, as Al said, the largest jurisdictions wanted in. Some of the smaller ones did not want to participate. And we have those all geofenced into the system here so that if an operator does deploy, the vehicles will not be allowed to be parked in the jurisdictions that have opted out. Doesn't mean that they can't be left there, but there'll be repercussions for the user and the vendor will be notified that their vehicle is somewhere where it's not allowed and they'll have to go get it. Um, the main focus, which uh, Council Member Al Albernaz highlighted here, is what are the safety concerns with these uh, devices? And I will admit I came to this from much the same place of saying, why would we introduce something new to our network that seems to have a set of unknown risks to it? And through the research that we've done, um, I've been convinced that it's worth giving it a try, and I'll, and I'll tell you why. Um, the scooter accidents are similar to bike accidents. The physics of the scooter are not radically different from that of a bicycle. They're operating at a similar speed. If anything, that there's a lower center of gravity to the scooter than a bicycle, so there may be less chance of injury to the operator. There's the opportunity for these to replace car trips. If we talk about a collision on the scooter versus a collision in the car, we're talking between 10 and 40 percent less force in that collision, just due to the masses of the of the vehicle. A typical car weighing around 4,000 pounds, a typical scooter. I don't know what a typical operator weighs, but we're in the neighborhood of under 300 pounds. Um, and if we assume they're at the same speed, we're in that 10 times to, to 20 times range for cars. If the cars are going faster, then we get to that 20 to 40 times range in the force. So a collision between a scooter and a pedestrian is nothing like a collision between a typical car and a pedestrian. We can build and maintain infrastructure. We complain about the state of our infrastructure. But our infrastructure in this county is really pretty good, and it's really better than a lot of other places that are operating these programs. Like Baltimore City, streets are far rougher than our own. Um, so we have infrastructure that is suitable for these. It doesn't mean there aren't areas that aren't concerning, higher speed quarters, et cetera, but we can provide the infrastructure we need. The users have to be 16 uh, to register for this. Of course, people can break any rule we make, uh, and people will break this rule, uh, but that's a matter of personal responsibility. The companies are setting up the provisions to require 16-year-old or greater operations. In the national data, we've seen the, the fatalities are largely at night, excepting the one in DuPont Circle. Um, and our, our program will not operate in the overnight hours. Uh, the CDC study was mentioned. We're looking forward to that because that will give some conclusive evidence about what the safety implications are these, because everything we have now are small samples and anecdotal. And in Portland, you know, innovative ideas for how to police these are emerging. Portland has come up with something innovative in that the company is fined for the misuse, and then it's up to the company to pass the fine on to the operator. We are not proposing that now, but if that's something that we think is needed, that's a model we can follow. Um, so more data here. Um, in Arlington County, there have been about uh, a quarter of a million trips on e-scooters since they started their pilot. There have been 24 crashes. Only three of those were with pedestrians, and about half the crashes were people crashing the scooter on their own and not involving anybody who wasn't using the scooter. The next, in Baltimore, there were 63 emergency room visits and about three-quarters of a million scooter trips. Um, so again, a very low incident of injuries significant enough to draw somebody to the emergency room. We did have the, the fatality in uh, DuPont Circle. The, Circumstances are not entirely clear about who was at fault in that particular collision, but it is something that we are very concerned about. And then from industry, we had some data about one incident uh, uh, resulting in injury for every 20, 27,000 trips. Um, so you know, it's not, a, it's not a common occurrence. It does happen, but it's not the common occurrence in scooter crashes. 
In terms of state legislation, we've been working very hard to get a bill passed that classifies these as bicycles. As Al said, it has passed both houses. I don't know whether it's been signed yet, but we expect that it will be. And this sets up all of the legal framework for how scooters get used in our roads without creating a new set of laws for them specifically. And they will be required to follow all the traffic rules under that. In terms of the county, current county regulations, um, our law does not allow a motorized vehicle, including an e-bike, on sidewalks. Scooters being classified as bicycles, or even if they're not, if they're a motor vehicle, they will not be allowed to be used on our sidewalks unless we act otherwise. And there may be reason to act otherwise, but we're not proposing that now. Um, and then our county MOU reiterates that they must follow those laws and goes into a lot of other safety requirements. And with that, I'll turn it over to Gary, who's managing the program for us, to talk specifically about what those requirements are. Yeah, thank you. So uh, we manage the program through an MOU. Uh, a draft MOU is in your packet, and we release that to the public on our website. We got comments back from uh, vendors, um, those eight vendors that, that Chris talked about. We're in the process of, we, res we also responded to those questions on the website, and, and we are in the process of relooking at our MOU to add different provisions that have come from those, some of those questions. Some of the policies um, that we found is that, like what Chris had talked about, we had a, 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 an e-bike program, but there were no e-bikes for the last few months. So if you're going to have a program, people need to know the bikes are available and where they're at. So we are talking about when we, t when we advance this pilot phase three to have a minimum number of vehicles being available pretty much at all time and also a maximum. This is ex consistent with what's going on in the region. And again, it depends on the area that we're talking about ultimately and, and obviously the, based on the area and the size. But we're, we're talking about the concept of a minimum and a maximum. Then the question comes in, when do you increase, when can you change? And again, this is based on some national, national experience with jurisdictions. If, if the vehicles are being used, fully being used, then they can make an argument that we need to add more vehicles. And so we would look at the responsiveness of the vendor. Um, and there are some standards that we're proposing. Uh, for your information, the Parks Department, um, we're not, um, proposing or suggesting regulations or a program for parks. Parks is actually investigating it themselves. Um, next slide. In terms of vendor responsibilities, again, these are mostly laid out, but I'd like to just highlight a few things. Um, we, like with the current pilots, previous pilots, there's insurance requirements where we're an additionally insured. Um, and in fact, we've been told that actually our insurance requirements are slightly higher than others in the region. Um, there's a performance bond, and this really relates to a couple things. If, there, if we have to tow vehicles or we have to move vehicles or there is some, some concern of, of damage, then um, if the company does not uh, do the right thing, um, then we have the ability to claim um, on their performance bond. Monthly reporting is very important. We need data. Uh, obviously, you need data on safety, you need data on trips, we need to know how this is improving air quality, sustainability, and the other things that, that, that Al talked about uh, at the beginning of the presentation. And so, uh, because there is some standards now, there weren't initially, now there's standards on how data gets reported, that uh, we are looking at the national standards and we're using a third, we would be using a third party that would be collecting the data and analyzing it and mapping it out so that we can then check where they're at, where the trips are going, um, what distribution there is within, within the county. Um, a couple of things that are really important um, that the public has said is how responsive are these vendors to concerns and crisis. So um, the MOU established certain times, but typically the, the, the companies are telling us that they staff up to be able to respond within two hours. So if there is a parking violation that is not urgent, that has to be solved instantly, then you know, they're told about it, then they have a, a period of time which they have to respond. 
during the uh, state legislative session um, that Chris talked about, getting some legislation passed, we've had a couple of very productive discussions um, with uh, the disability community, particularly the visually impaired. And um, they're concerned that if a vehicle is misparked, maybe crossing a sidewalk, and they need to contact somebody to get it moved, how do you know which, whose vehicle it is and what the contact is? We are the first, I think, probably in the country to require a, some sort of embossed printing, tactile logo that would explain contact information, website, phone numbers. Um, so this is an experiment on our part um, that I'm sure will be watched. The companies have want, want, obviously they like to push back on that because it's something new, but it's something we are going to require. And the other issue that I think was very successful um, with the, the pedal bikes and the e-bikes is that when you have a lot of bikes, that you don't want them all on the same block. You don't want them all blocking the same storefront. Um, and so we set up um, at the beginning of the first pilot, you can't have more than three of these vehicles by company on any block face. So depending on how many companies you have, that's how many you could have there. The nuance here is that, you know, the scooters, maybe you, you, you may not know this, but the scooters, you know, are, are, are positioned in the morning, maybe six in the morning, um, and they're picked up at night, at dark, because the companies have to recharge them. And so where they're placed in the morning is pretty critical. And so we want to work with the companies to know and identify locations so that they're not creating a problem. So that's where we really want to kind of work with the company. Um, and we have parking policies. We kind of referred to them uh, where they can be. Um, it's a continuation of the current policy in the MOU, only in public right-of-way, um, bike parking areas, designated areas, sidewalks um, that cannot impede pedestrian movement, that can't block fire hydrants, that can't block or interfere with street furniture, bus stops, interfere with traffic. Again, that's where why the, the vendor would then be called and have to move them, or quite frankly, um, the scooters may be unlike bicycles, may, may be easier to move if someone just sees them. They certainly are welcome, welcome and encouraged to move them and put them in the, where they belong. Um, so we also want to, on this slide, in the picture if you can see, for the, for the pedal bikes and for the e-bikes, we've created a couple of these preferred parking areas. Um, they were used by the vendors, but not necessarily used by the user. We wanted them to park the bikes back in those places because those were congested areas. Um, so we're going to continue to work with the vendor on those preferred parking areas. Um, and the county does have the authority uh, at the vendor expense to move, to move the, the dockless vehicles if they are creating problems and under special, special emergency. So one of the highlights of any program is going to be how responsive are we going to be to the customers, to the public. And we, we've developed a pretty good system, I think, uh, near the end of the, after the first month or two of, of a rough end uh, on our side uh, um, of getting lots of complaints. Um, we've developed a pretty good system of we're using 311 and Sandy's group, Sandy Brecker's group, um, commuter services, which are out promoting um, alternative vehicles. So we're asking each of these companies, and they all do, they have websites, they have information, they have um, apps, um, and we want to get that information out. One of the things that I didn't mention, which I think is important, is that we're asking that each of the companies have public education programs. And if you go to any of these companies' websites, they all have how to use, how to ride, how to be safe, how to wear a helmet. Um, all the companies say they can't be ridden on sidewalks. All different companies have different age limits, whether it's 16 or 18. Many of the companies require a picture of your driver's license. Um, so there is a way that they're trying to regulate who can use these. And, um, and because they know who rented and they know where the bikes are, um, if there are violations, they can get back to the renter and they can either find them if they parked in one of these uh, jurisdictions that are not allowed to park or if they have parking problems. And they have public education. One of the things that we would do as a department, as we do with bicycles today, 
is that we would have a uh, regularly planned um, locations where people can try to ride these for free. Get an experience in a safe area, a parking lot, and on, without cars <laughs> parked, and, and ride. And we have the companies come in and, and do that. Um, and we, we would initially sponsor them, but we would hope the companies would also take the initiative to do that on their own. The one other thing I'd like to mention before we open for your questions is we did work with police um, while, while we were um, getting the responses here to understand some of their concerns and their main concern was that we get too much going on in any one place so we have agreed that we would deploy certain providers in certain locations so that we don't have all of the scooters ending up in the same area. We can understand the performance of the, of the companies individually better that way and they'll have a better handle on where to pay attention to where these are in service and keep an eye on their operation. All right, thank you. Um, let's see, we have Councilman Bob Bernos. Thank you, great presentation. You absolutely answered many of my questions and I knew that you had given a lot of thought to this, but this helped sort of highlight some of the questions and concerns that I had. I did have a few follow-up questions. So are they permitted on the sidewalks in the District of Columbia currently or not? Uh, yes and no. So uh, in the downtown area, they're not. Outside the downtown area, we understand they are. Okay, because I, I think it's a good thing that they won't be permitted on sidewalks in Montgomery County because that alleviates some of the ambiguity. But because many residents may be riding on them and in D.C. and then coming over here and the same rules won't apply, if there's a mechanism maybe where we have the stations that we can make very crystal clear that they're not permitted on sidewalks, um, I think that would help. Actually, uh, uh, one of the things that I asked Chris to, uh, to make a note of in our MOU is uh, that the uh, companies, vendors, actually get a consent from the users that in Montgomery County they are not allowed to ride on the sidewalk regardless of which street, what road, and where. So that actually pushes the fact that we don't want these uh, vehicles, not either uh, electric bikes either. They should not be in our sidewalks. I think uh, the speed is uh, too fast. Our sidewalks some, in some cases are narrow. And uh, I felt that uh, for the safety of our uh, pedestrian, we cannot allow these vehicles to be on the sidewalk. Thank you, I appreciate that. And while I um, respect that we're requiring the companies to ensure a public education process. They, of course, don't know our public as well as we do. And so uh, I think forging a very intentional partnership and alliance through our civic associations, citizens advisory boards, all the same mechanisms we're using around Vision Zero, uh, I think will, will be very important. And I did have the opportunity to meet with uh, representatives from the traffic division of MCPD, and they acknowledged the great partnership with DOT, but they did express major reservation about mm -hmm. this and significant concern uh, that we're just going to brace ourselves and see what happens, uh, which, which didn't leave me feeling very right. good. Uh, and I know we're trying to address as many provisions on the front end as possible, but um, you know they're obviously the experts out in the field with regards to what's currently going on today. and that didn't leave me feeling very comfortable. Yeah, as Chris mentioned, I had a meeting with Chief Manger and his deputy, and actually Captain Daidon as well, and we did talk about uh, implementation of these scooters on our county uh, uh, network, and uh, we both agreed that we are not gonna just fill the whole county, we're gonna go a little bit slower uh, during our pilot area, we're gonna limit uh, number of scooters and so forth. So uh, we had that conversation, and I think uh, at the end, we both felt comfortable that this is something that can be can move forward with. And Great. we do have the option to terminate at any time if we're finding we're having a problem with a particular provider or in general with this system. Great. Um, our bike master plan is obviously going to put us in an even better position than other jurisdictions because we're taking into account. But I do want to acknowledge there's, I wouldn't say it's apples and oranges, but there is a difference between bicycles and even e-bicycles and these scooters because the the depth and how large they are, the presence that they provide on a street, um, 
obviously nothing compared to a car, but there's still a greater presence when you're on a bicycle versus when you're on one of these things because their circumference is so small. And, and 20 miles per hour, uh, which is the top speed as is currently within the MOU, uh, is actually, uh, 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 that's what it says in the MOU here, that it can go up to 20. Um, but I wanted to confirm that that was accurate because I do think calibrating them so that they can't exceed more than 15, I think, makes that more sense. That was my understanding, and I will make sure that we, uh, we limit those uh, on our county roads at 15 miles per hour. Uh, and then I just have two requests. So, uh, and, and it is clear that you, at least two requests, uh, it is clear that you've applied many of the lessons learned from the e-bike share, because I can see it in the MOU, uh, particularly with regards to the responsiveness of the collection of of the vehicles themselves, but, uh, and there is a requirement for them to report out crashes. Um, I would like to go one step further than that and partner with our emergency rooms, because as the CDC report indicates, um, many of the crashes, uh, and particularly the pedestrians that are hit by these, are going unreported. Uh, and so there's an under, under, under report. Um, the other thing, and, I think the CDC report will be very helpful in having us administer additional policies. Right now, as an example, uh, they're likely going to recommend that only one person per vehicle is allowed. Uh, I've been in DC again many times recently and have seen as many as you know, two people or uh, a parent and a child riding these things together, uh, which seems like a really bad idea. Um, so that I, you know, that provision will be important. And then driving these vehicles while impaired uh, also causes some concern. I, I heard your comment regarding there being uh, more incidents in the evening. Actually, the reports we've read so far is they, they occur all day. Uh, it's not just in the evening, but obviously when you add um, alcohol or any other sort of substance on top of mm -hmm you know, impairment, then that, that's a recipe for disaster. And so that's something that, uh, and, and I appreciate shutting them off after a certain hour. I think that will help address many of those specific issues. Um, and then the development that's going on in Bethesda and Silver Spring right now, which is creating lots of uh, unusual traffic patterns uh, as we adjust to the development of the new Marriott building, just as one example, um, I think it's something we have to pay close attention to because, you know, it's it, people are struggling to walk, let alone ride one of these e-scooters in some of these areas. And so to the degree to which we can offer some support or signage in areas where we, we know we're going to have a problem, uh, I, I think would be important as well. Actually, we are not planning to employ in the Bethesda at this time during this initial pilot. Right. So we are mindful of all the construction and the sidewalks that are blocked and, and, and all the other challenges we have in, in downtown Bethesda. Right. All right, I think that's it for now. There's uh, other lights, thanks. Councilmember Rice. Well, thank you very much. So let me first start off by saying that I'm a big fan of these scooters. I hadn't seen them uh, until I went on a college visit with my daughter to Ohio State University. And the reason why I saw them is because I saw them littered all over the sidewalks there. Uh, and it was interesting because I said, what in the world are these things? And I thought for a moment that it was like a, you know, one of those tours that happens where you rent segways and everybody's on their segways. And I thought, oh, this is a new tour thing. And then as I saw them around on campus and wherever and continued to see them just littered about, whether it was the scooters or the e-bikes. And so... You know, there's, well, there's great documentation about Ohio State and some of the new regulations that they've put forth as a result, a huge university uh, who, again, I, I, I think they're great. It's just about how to manage and regulate them is a tremendous concern. And, you know, when you look at what happened in San Francisco, and so this spring break, I'll be able to report to you as I go to Sacramento uh, and tour UC Davis, uh, that I'll be able to report to you on what's happening in Sacramento, who's also looking at this right now and evaluating and be able to give you some direct feedback with, you know, a community who's, you know, uh, really at the forefront of trying to move this technology forward and seeing what some of the pitfalls and uh, some of the great things as a result. Uh, but one of the things in California that struck me that was very interesting that I haven't heard us talk about 
because you talked about it at the beginning when you talked about accessibility. And the reality is, is that with all of the apps, and I've got them on my phone, they all require a credit card. Uh, and oftentimes, our people who are uh, immigrants, our people who are of lower socioeconomic status, don't have credit cards. And so from that perspective, you're actually keeping out the folks, some of the folks who may be able to utilize this technology most, the very people who you talked about you're trying to reach. And I know in some areas, they've actually put, and California is looking at this and putting and saying that you have to have another uh, means of allowing people to pay beyond credit cards. So have you had that conversation with vendors? I, I actually, um, as you recall, uh, when we started Capital Bike Share, we were mindful of that same situation. And, and, and in regards to the, our e-scooters, I'm going to ask uh, um, uh, Gary to give you an update on where Thank they are you. on that. Yeah. yeah, we have the MC Liberty program, and that actually was the um, the start of our uh, um, capital bike share program for a grant we got to do that. Um, and that still continues. So um, most of the companies do offer programs. That was one of the questions we were asking them that have a, um, an alternative to using a credit card. So either, either you go to a, you know, a CVS or something and, and get a code um, and then you pump, punch the code into the unlocking mechanism. Uh, we also have the ability through um, our trip store and our mobile commuter store to also work with the vendors to provide some um, alternative ways uh, to, to ride these. Some also offer half price, um, half price to get started on the first, the first trip. So I think it'll be really important for us to make sure that that's visible. Like I said, I'm on Bird's site right now, and it's not. Um, same with Lime. And so from that perspective, it really will be one of those where, again, they'll need to make sure that that's out there as we talk about our equity policy, right? I'm, I'm telling you, Council President, you have made me a different legislator as a result of this because I'm always thinking about those things and making sure that they are there. So again, we'll need to make sure that that's out front. Um, so thank you for that, and thank you for your continued commitment on that. So let's talk about safety. Um, we've talked about pedestrians uh, who are, uh, you know, dealing with these uh, uh, vehicles that will now be on the road. I'm curious as to what our conversation about helmets is and what the word should means. Coming from Annapolis, uh, as a legislator, should is a very weak uh, word, and so from that perspective, I'm really concerned about the fact of that, you know, uh, when we give out skateboards at any of our parks, we require that you have a helmet. Um, you know, uh, I, I think that when you're talking about, you know, we can continue to argue about whether or not for bicycles, but I can tell you that the majority of children that we talk about, especially under age of 18, we're always telling them that they should have helmets. We talk about that in bicycle safety, right? So. Um, when you're talking about a motorized vehicle like this, and you are talking about people who are 16, understanding that, again, brain injury, 52% reduction in serious brain injury with a helmet, 44% reduction in death, possibility of death, while wearing a helmet. This is a motorized vehicle, 15 to 20 miles an hour, in traffic. And that's the other thing. So potential of getting hit by a car is much higher than if you're on a sidewalk. Are we going to mandate helmet usage for these vehicles? You are right. We would certainly like every user to use a, a helmet. The helmet laws that pertain to bicycles will pertain to the use of these. So there's no additional provision in law or in our MOU for that. And it is a huge barrier to get people to using them. So it's, um, it's a trade-off that is really uncomfortable and has been in place with bicycles bicycle share and these systems. Yeah, I would just say that the difference is, again, you're talking about a motorized vehicle and talking about in traffic. So it's a very different scenario. You know, the sidewalk, I again, and I understand where you're coming from, Mr. Conklin. I've got tremendous respect for you in yep. terms of, and you know this, I'm not just saying this, uh, in terms of safety. But this is one where I think we're really going to have to rethink this. All it's going to take is one subdural hematoma from somebody who's fallen, you know, and, and it changes there. So I think from that, we really need to give some thought to what it is. Others are doing it. California is looking at it right now. Other jurisdictions are looking at it as well, at least under the age of 18. 
right? So even if we were to just say, look, if you're under 18, that 16 to 18 uh, framework, and just say must. And we know that there will be people who won't follow the law. I understand that, but at least it'll give us some teeth to really start mm -hmm. encouraging people to utilize them, right? Because we know how difficult it is. And I, and, and, and I just think about, you know, I'll just close with this. My daughter, uh, both of my daughters who have electric scooters, and we require that they wear a helmet. Uh, and then she got one of those little scooters that you, you know, ride on that looks like a little mini Vespa. And again, require, and she hates it. She's like, I look stupid wearing a helmet. And I said, yeah, well, just think about, you know, how you'd feel if you got hit by a car and right. would you feel stupid then? So, I mean, it's really one of those where, again, it's about making sure that we're trying to do the best to protect our community, understanding that, again, if it, they were on the sidewalk, it'd be a different story. But then being in mixed traffic, there's higher risk of a serious incident with a thousands of pound vehicle and from that standpoint you know we want to give them as much protection uh, as possible. I appreciate your suggestion. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Councilmember Reamer. Thank you. Good discussion. Appreciate the hard work you've put into this program and really you have a very thorough understanding of all of the different uh, aspects of implementing this program and uh, you've been responsive to a lot of different concerns that are are out there and we're we're still in our early stages of you know understanding what this could mean I, I think this is a revolution in urban mobility and montgomery county as a community that does have urban areas does not want to be left out of what is happening in this country and the region uh in the world around us i think that people know that you can get this quality of life that you can have these types of choices in other communities, and it's a it's a reflection, it's a statement about a community when you don't have them. Uh, I worry a little bit for Bethesda not having access to the pilot, but as it becomes deployed in Silver Spring and Tacoma Park, and perhaps it'll people will start to say, why not? Why not me too? Um, but uh, you know, I think that the fact that we're moving forward with it is really important. I, I totally understand the concerns about injury. And the reality is these are a lot like bicycles. And probably nobody knows better than me about getting injured on bicycles up sitting on this dais because unfortunately I'm far too practiced at that. But uh, you know, the, the reality is if you move with any type of speed, and that's literally also including walking, there's a risk of injury. The second you start moving, you have energy in your body and you can trip, you can fall, you can crash, you can be hit by someone else. The only thing worse than that probably is not moving, staying on bed, staying in your bed, staying at your house. That's worse. So there, you know, we just we have to embrace the reality that people need choices in mobility. The fact that 50% of these trips are trips that would otherwise be in vehicles, that's huge. I didn't know that. I, I wondered. I wondered. I wondered if maybe a lot of these weren't people who would have biked otherwise. But the fact that they're trips that would otherwise be in vehicles. This is really significant. Uber and Lyft are choking our streets with cars. They've incentivized people to just drive around trolling for fares, blocking up our roads, causing crashes, hitting pedestrians, hitting bikers. And this is actually moving against that trend. It's not a, you know, it doesn't mean that there aren't consequences. We know from physics, every action has an equal and opposite reaction. That applies to these vehicles, but I think we ought to look at them as we do bikes, and we should allow them where bikes are allowed and, and it kind of embrace them philosophically. I think it's really exciting that we are moving forward with our protected bike lane networks, which I think will become much more valuable than we knew that they would be when we started to plan them. When we started to plan them, they were just for bikes. Now we have the opportunity to have them established where people can because you can use those lanes in a scooter, right? That that is a provision. Yes, absolutely. That we're, yeah. Yeah. So you can be buffered from cars, um, but there's going to be a learning process there. How scooters and bikes interact. That's going to be a whole thing we're going to we're going to hear about. But uh, I, you know, I think it's notable when we had the Economic Development Corporation here two weeks ago. They talked about the fact that you can get scooters in Montgomery County. Uh, they were a little ahead of us there, but as we think about trying to fill up the Discovery headquarters. 
you know, we, we're trying to attract 40, 50 companies probably to fill that, that building. It, it, it says a lot when a prospective tenant is walking around Silver Spring and they see life, they see arts, they see culture, they see mobility choices. That's the modern urban environment. And it will, it will help them know that their employees have access to the same amenities, the same lifestyles, the same choices in Montgomery County that they can get in DC or Northern Virginia or other parts of the country for that matter. So while being mindful for safety, while being very intentional about public education, and I, I worked with you to sponsor that town hall we did with the dockless bike uh, pilot. It was, it was absolutely necessary. We needed a chance to hear from people, to let people share their concerns, and to start educating a little bit more effectively. That's, this is part of the process. This discussion today is part of the process. We've got, there has to be mitigation and, and concerns raised. Uh, but at the same time, I think we do need to embrace the future of mobility in Montgomery County and, and see where this could go. It, it, you, you know, what about one day shutting down downtowns to vehicles? That's something that people dream about in the urban planning world. You're never going to be able to do that without choices like this. You know? So I'm glad we're proceeding, and I will be watching closely, and I really appreciate your work. I think the concerns that have been raised are significant. You know, we've all had near misses from different types of vehicles. I had one recently from a car coming out of a parking garage. I was walking, a car almost ran into me. This is part of our daily lives. We have to be careful, but we do need to educate scooter users about safety. So that's gonna be really important. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Jawando, please. Thank you, Council, Council Vice President. It's the first time I've been able to say that. You, yeah. That you've kicked it to me, so yeah, that's yeah. exciting. <laughs> well, and she was only two steps yeah. away. I mean, I was close. I, I, I was yeah, glad he was finished. Yeah, really. <laughs> we, we barely got in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> thank you uh, for the presentation. It was very helpful. So, you know, I, too, uh, the first half of your presentation is really exciting, right? All the, 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 st the stats around why people are using them, how we, they deferred car usage, uh, ride sharing. Um, and those are all good things, and I think uh, bode well for long-term accessibility, multimodal transportation, and equity for different people, and low-income folks, so a whole bunch of positives there. I, but I do share some concerns, obviously, that you've heard, heard here around safety. Um, and I, just a couple questions, and then I wanted to reference this, a study, this, the Los Angeles study, which I'm sure you guys have looked at. I think it was in the post uh, in, in January is the article I read, which kind of seemed to m maybe contradict is a strong word, but not necessarily align with your presentation. So your, your top bullet for safety was scooters accidents are similar to bicycle accidents. Though basically the main point of this study, which was a one year period study in LA, was that they're not similar to bicycle accidents and there's more and they're more severe. And so I, I just wanted to know could you talk about that and that just that because that's kind of a basic assumption that's kind of at the heart of the safety issue is are they similar to are the accidents and injuries similar to bicycles or they're not and the I these it seem to be some conflicting information on that actually I the, the level of information we have is kind of what we we presented I mean we we were in talking to Arlington and and Baltimore which have done analyses, um, we can go back to them and ask, can you give us your similar statistics for, for, for bicycles? Um, and how long of a period were they looking at? These were at? six months. These okay. were six months. Both of them were six months, most recently. Um, but the numbers are, um, I mean, one of the things you might extrapolate from, from the, what we had presented for Baltimore, that they have le less than 2,000 scooters um, and they are carrying over 40,000 trips a week. On, two th on less than 2,000? 2,000 scooters. scooters. Do Companies, you know how many people that is? Uh, actually, we could go back and look. Okay. Because, you know, obviously they're repeat um, users, but there are a lot of new people as well. I mean, we, in our, in our uh, limited first pilot, you know, there were many thousands of people 
that tried the bikes in Silver Spring. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think we could go back and look and look at the data yeah, a little more. And, and look at the LA study. That was a one-year period, and right. again, it it was like you know they said the ER visits were higher than bicycle or pedestrian or walkers, and that they were more severe. And that's just something I think we need to be tracking, especially as we embark on a pilot ourselves and and look at the best data and research available because that's significant. Obviously, the CDC is going to do their work, but we need to we need to do ours. Uh, just to confirm, these will not be allowed on sidewalks. That's correct? This is correct. Okay. Great. And I think we need to stick to that. That's, these are, again, uh, Councilman Rice and others have brought this up. These are motorized uh, vehicles, not, uh, they're not bikes. In, in my, they, they're similar but different in that they, you know, you don't have to pump your legs. Go ahead. You wanted to say something? Well, you know, whichever county council developed the current law must have seen this coming <laughs> because they exactly prescribed the difference between a powered bicycle and a non-powered bicycle. So they were, what's the word? I can't think of the right word. Our, our, our visionary uh, forebears. That's great. Um, the, uh, the, the, hel the helmet law, uh, my understanding is that California does have a law requiring helmet for these vehicles. Uh, for these e-scooters, um, and and just to confirm, your position is that that would not be a good thing. I don't think we said that. Uh, okay, I maybe I misheard. The current law does not require a helmet, and um, and I think under 16, yeah. And uh, uh, the thing is, uh, in, in other jurisdiction, neighboring jurisdiction, that these uh, scooters and e-bikes are being used, uh, they're not required to be wearing helmet. So it's something that we have to work with the vendors and see if there is a change in the overall uh, attitude toward these vehicles. And uh, so we go from there. But right now, it is not illegal to ride an uh, e-scooter or uh, e-bicycle on the street without helmet. Yeah, the one thing I, I, I do want to add is that we offer helmets um, uh, for capital bike share, uh, we again encourage uh, the low uh, the low income. I guess get them for free. So the people that are MC Liberty program, we give them we mail them out for free. Um, each of these companies really want you to wear helmets. I mean, I, their own reasons why they're, it's a good policy, and they offer discount also on helmets. Yeah. And I don't know whether they offer free or not, but they offer a significant discount on the helmets and they encourage it. So I think the, the question that was raised about um, um, we getting a consent from users not to run on sidewalks, you know, we could probably look at, see what kind of consent that they should be wearing helmets as well. But that doesn't get them to put the helmet on. Right. Well, I mean, look, people are going to do what they're going to do, but I think us sending a signal that these are required, it's, a, it's an important safety measure, um, and recognizing the difference between e-scooters and bicycles. If we're encouraging it, highly encouraging it for bicycles, I think we should be requiring it for e-scooters. I just think that makes sense. Um, and the other question, you, it was a good segue, you, you said about the companies. Um, you mentioned that many of them require driver's licenses to sign in, is that correct? Yes, once, once you, you set up an account with that company, you, they want you to take a picture on your phone and send, it, send the driver's license. So another recommendation I'd have is, if you know right now, great, who are the companies that require that? And let's use those vendors, let's not use the ones that don't require it. Um, you know, I, I think another, any way we can try to enforce the rules that the companies have themselves that we think are gonna help with safety. So it sounds like there was a difference between some do, some don't. Do we have, do you, can you answer that today? Do you know which ones we're using and which ones don't require that? I would have to look into, look into it. Okay, well that would be another suggestion. But overall, I think, you know, look, we're gonna get some data here. We're gonna, I think we proceed with caution, literally and figuratively, um, and uh, hopefully we can make sure people are using these safely. So thank you for the presentation. Vice President Katz. Thank you very much, and thank you for the presentation. It's really been enlightening. All right, so can you literally walk me through, if, and not that I'm going to be the person that's going to rent these, but maybe I would if they're, if they're easy enough. All right, how do, how do I go about it? I see, I see the scooters on, I'm not, my wife is listening maybe, and I'm not going to ride a bicycle, but anyhow. So I, I see a scooter on the 
in the docking areas or the dockless areas. And so I walk over and say, okay, I'm considering doing this. What happens then? There's actually a vid video um, on all the companies, but um, like uh, Lime or, or, or um, you know, Bird, you could go and do that. But this is what you do, and the, they actually show you. You, you have to go to their mobile app um, and, and sign in, and obviously you have to certify certain things, give them your credit card, maybe a picture of your driver's license as well. And then um, with that information, you can uh, take a picture of the, like the, the GPS unit, um, lock unit on, on the, uh, uh, well, I'll take a picture of the, the scooter um, uh, QR code, and it would unlock the scooter for you, and then you you're off. And then when you finish, you have to then close the trip on your app. All right. And then if I stop in a in a way, you know, certainly for a healthy lunch or whatever I'd be doing, if I stop on the way, then then I come out, and then I just start it again. Is that no? You would you would hopefully you probably don't want to pay for the scooter rental while you're having lunch. So it's by the, the minute or yes, whatever it is, by, by the, the time. Minute. And, and typically, um, they're like $1.50 to start the trip and some, some percent, some increment per minute. I don't know if it's 15 or 25 cents per minute. So I mean, you, and these trips typically are um, 10, 15 minutes. No one, no one is taking them really a long distance. You could. There's a range of 20 or 30 miles on these things if you want. And some people yeah. have, in fact, right. seen how far they can go, and you pay by the minute. So typically, I know my son in Austin, Texas, uses them, and and he sends me an email. He gets afterwards how on how far he went, how fast he went, how many calories or whatever, how many emissions he saved <laughs> um, by doing that. And his trips are two, three dollars. You know, so it basically it's cheaper than than using an Uber or Lyft, and in sure. fact, that's one of the motivations why they're in the business, because they don't want the they don't want their their drivers of cars to, to actually make these short trips. They're not making money. They'd rather have you link to the first mile, last mile, on on a scooter. All right, so. And that's all helpful, and you answered a few of my other questions along the way there. But so if, if I stop for lunch, then I need to go and put it back in a dockless area? How does that work? No, just leave it? Well, you would hopefully leave it in a safe parking area uh, on the right, on, 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 on the right, in the right of way on the sidewalk that was, that was enough room that would not block anybody or a wheelchair from, or an entrance. So we can, you can you just park drop it. You just park it where you, where you finished your trip. But you can park it on a sidewalk. You can't ride it on the sidewalk. The way, right, you right. have to okay. take it off the sidewalk. And, and um, is there a GPS in there? How does the company know where, where I left my scooter? They're, they have a GPS. And in fact, that's the reason we see all of these new technologies, all these new um, revolutionary um, Mobility options because of the technology of the GPS, so it knows where it knows where you went, it tracks you, and in fact, that's the type of information we get an anonymized. Uh, we don't we don't get a, we get anonymous, but we can get all of the routes that people take um, by time of day, by day of week, and so it helps us with our planning of our tech of our infrastructure to know where where these people are taking the trip. So they know exactly, well, exactly, within the accuracy of the unit, which may right. be 25 yards or 25 feet, where, where you're at. And, and the idea that it's not going to be in the ag reserve, well, obviously they're not going to rent too many in the ag reserve. So I, I know that the company wouldn't want to put any there. But, but so if someone wrote it or took it or whatever they did to the ag reserve, they would know that and know that they had to, to go, go retrieve it. If the person didn't ret didn't take it back out of the ag reserve in a period of time, they would say, "Yeah," because these scooters, and again, some people think this is a real advantage of the scooters, is they're picked up every night. Someone finds that scooter, gets paid to find the scooter, take it to their property, 
and charge them and then put them back at a defined location where they need to be. There is a geofencing and when you go outside in the, uh, in, in the area that you are not supposed to be going, so when you want to close the session, it actually tells you. And you get fined because they have to go and pick it up. So, uh, and then in terms of your question about going to a restaurant, you don't want to pay, pay by minute when you are sitting and eating right. lunch. So you basically lock it out and finish that session. And then, of course, when you come out of lunch, you can pick it up and go back to, to your or, office. Or someone else could pick it up, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah. Of course, so that one might, you might have to go look for another one. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. Council Member Glass. Thank you, Madam President. I just want to double down on a lot of the comments my, my colleagues have made about the importance of public education. We already have uh, more we already have too many incidents related to bicycles and some of the other transportation vehicles that are already allowed and adding this to the mix. Uh, we not only need to educate the users, as has been suggested, but also the general population. And to that end, my, my one question is, a car, a bicycle, and an e-scooter all enter a lane. The pause. They, they all enter a road, a lane. What's the priority? What is any one of those users supposed to understand when, when the convergence happens? I think under the current state law, I believe the bicycle and the scooter have parity with each other, and they would need to follow each other like any two similar vehicles under the state motor vehicle ordinances. And the provisions about the motor vehicle or car yielding or providing shy space to the bicycle and e-scooter would apply. And if it's a multi-lane road, there's requirements that the bicycle and the e-scooter be in the rightmost lane unless they're planning to turn left. So the, all the provisions that are already in the state motor vehicle laws would apply to that scenario. But I don't think there's a difference between the powered bike and the non-powered bike and one having and right then what about the vehicle over the other. And, and that parity compared to the vehicle? They are both have the right of way over the car in terms of the shy distances and other provisions that relate between cars and bicycles. And I'll refer back to my opening statement about public education and the importance of that. Right. Thank you. Then I agree more with what you said. And actually, I, I think part of our uh, because of the safety, and, and, and uh, we will be doing a lot of uh, public outreach. Uh, we will be talking to uh, some of the uh, commissions and groups, and we will go with our vendors and make a presentation. And you're absolutely right. Many drivers today on our road don't understand the law as it pertains to the bicyclists and those who are on, uh, on those uh, vehicles. Well, thank you so much for this briefing. It is so important um, for us to understand and for the public to understand. And, you know, on the one hand, we know that these types of modalities are very attractive and, and they're coming. Uh, and so just having all of these provisions, it's, it's really, I think, strikes the balance um, that I'm sure we will continue to monitor. Uh, so really do appreciate all the work that has gone into getting us to this point.